Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast. This is episode number 106. I'm Dinosaur George and thrilled to have you with us. In this episode, the feature creature is Dinochirus, a very unusual dinosaur that for a while was only known from its gigantic arms. Also, we're going to have an interview with paleontologist Scott Hartman. Scott is an artist who draws anatomically accurate dinosaur skeletons. Scott gives us a great, very in-depth, detailed uh, interview about what goes on to do that. And finally, at the end of the episode, we will ask some, or answer some Ask Dinosaur George questions. So sit back and relax. This is episode 106. This should be fun. Do you or someone you know like prehistoric life? Are you looking for that perfect gift for the dinosaur lover in your family? Our web store is filled with hundreds of replica claws, teeth, skulls, and more. Start a collection of your favorite animals today. Tyrannosaurus teeth, raptor claws, ice-aged mammal skulls, and more can be found in our catalog. Our prices are very affordable, and we don't add hidden or excessive shipping or handling charges. Visit us at store.dinosaurgeorge.com. It's time for our feature creature segment. If you would like to suggest a creature, go to dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com and post it in the comment section of this episode or email us your suggestions to contact at dinosaurgeorge.com. And now, our feature creature. The feature creature for this episode is Dinochirus. You know, originally, it was just a giant pair of arms, each measuring over 2.4 meters. That's almost eight feet long. And and it had a few other bones, but it was just these giant eight-foot-long arms. Nobody really knew what it looked like. It was discovered back in 1965, and the image of those huge arms and massive claws created a firestorm of interest. A lot of people were wondering what on earth could this thing have been because so few bones were found. Most of what we knew about the dinosaur was based on speculation. So at first, people thought it was a large carnivore, sort of similar to an Allosaurus. Now, Allosaurus is a big bipedal, two-legged predatory dinosaur, and everybody thought, man, based on the size of those arms, see, the arm of an Allosaurus is about eh, three feet, something like that. These were eight foot long arms so everyone thought if this thing is anything like an allosaurus it it would have been the most terrifying creature on the planet well in 2014 two new almost complete specimens were were uncovered and this gave scientists an opportunity finally to unravel the mystery of what this thing actually was now when it was first discovered uh, paleontologists kind of argued, what is this thing? Is it is it an Allosaurus-like animal? Is it a Spinosaurus-like animal? And a couple of people looking at the shape of the bones of the arm thought that it fit into a group called the Ornithomimosaurs, which is sort of a group that has the ostrich dinosaurs, like Ornithomimus, Struthiomimus, those kind of dinosaurs. And for any of you that, that aren't familiar with those, in the very first Jurassic Park movie, There's a scene where the paleontologist and the two kids are kind of hidden down behind some stuff, watching this flock of dinosaurs sort of run together. And then a T-Rex comes breaking out of the woods and grabs one of them and everybody takes off running. Those are are what ostrich dinosaurs mean. Now, the name Dinochirus was given to the dinosaur, and that name means horrible or terrible hands. So terrible hands is the name of this dinosaur because of those those gigantic claws it was discovered in the gobi desert in asia and they lived in the late cretaceous about 70 million years ago now based on the new discovery these things may have reached adult sizes of 40 feet long and weighing upwards of seven tons you're talking about of course we knew it was big based on the arms but it it was a monstrosity these animals now are recognized to be bipedal walking on two legs and they are omnivores 
not just being carnivores, but eating both plants and, and meat. And then um, they probably lived along freshwater lakes and streams, and they lived off the plants, but they also, from the evidence, they also ate fish. Now, with the new fossil evidence, paleontologists have a better opportunity to understand what this strange dinosaur would have looked like. But reconstructing an animal that lived 70 million years ago is no small task. To help us understand what sort of work goes into reconstructing ancient skeletons, I'm very happy to have with us paleontologist Scott Hartman. Scott, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, George. I'm glad that, happy to be here. Great. So, so tell us a little bit, Scott. About tell us about yourself. Tell us about your career. What you what you sort of do. Sure. So, I have worn many hats in my career. I have ran the science side of a small museum in Thermopolis, the Lyman Dinosaur Center, for quite a few years. I teach. Um, I'm currently doing research uh, on the thermal ecology of uh, vertebrates in the Mesozoic. But what I'm probably the best known for is uh, producing anatomical diagrams, usually in the form of, of skeletal reconstructions of dinosaurs and other extinct animals. I, I became familiar with you years ago for that very reason. I, you know, I'd, I'd been looking at dinosaur images and it seems like I'd open up these books and there I would see your name at the bottom of all these different dinosaurs. And that kind of that kind of intrigued me, to say the least, about what you do. So now to, to have a better understanding, and before we go into information about Dinochirus, I want the listeners to have an understanding of, of kind of how hard it is to do what you do. So let's say I've got 75% of a skeleton of a dinosaur that nobody's ever seen. And I walk into your living room and I dump the bones on the table and I say, there, what, what do you do with these bones? How on earth can you formulate what it looks like? Well, the very first thing I do in this case is send a text message to my wife to warn her that our house is going to be a mess when she gets home. <laughs> you know, I would be a witness at the divorce. I would be there for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um <laughs> And she would probably understand in this case if we had a new dinosaur, but still, I'd want to make sure that everyone was on the up and up. <laughs> um, uh, so, so the next thing, of course, really, outside of simply trying to sort out all of the bones into their correct order and repairing any damage from the dumping them out process, would be uh, you know, to gather contextual information. Where did you find it? So you'd be able to identify what the rocks were, either because you recalled or had photographs or perhaps did lots of great uh, mapping and got other work there so we could put it into the proper spatial that is geographic as well as time context. And then the next thing would be to try to figure out who it's related to. So before like pencil and paper ever come together or digital, you know, mouse and, and digital canvas ever come together, the first thing you have to really do is make sure all the fossil bones are accessible and that you have some idea of who it's related to in part because when you have to fill in that missing 75%, I'm a big advocate of you don't just go, well, it kind of probably looks like this. What I actually want to do is have a, a series of studies done that'll show what the trends are within that group and within other animals so that you can really constrain as, as best as possible what we should expect to see in the missing uh, elements. And that'll take usually somewhere between a couple of days and years, depending on how much prep work and description has to be done. But somewhere in there, we'll skip over that part. We get to the actual, you know, fun, so to speak. What does it look like? How do we put it back together? And so that starts out uh, usually with a uh, camera, preferably one with a long telephoto lens rather than like a phone camera. Um, not because phone cameras don't have fantastic quality. They do these days. But when you don't shoot through a uh, telephoto lens, you get a uh, phenomenon called parallax, which causes basically the three-dimensional shape of the bone to warp it from the point of view of like a wide angle lens. That is like the parts that are closer or wider than the parts that are a few inches further away. And the way you fix that to get it into something closer to a true like architectural plan view is to get as far away from the bone as you can and then zoom back in with like one of those really long lenses you put onto an SLR type of camera. And then the other thing is you measure everything. For my purposes, I don't always have to have as many measurements as some people do in scientific descriptions, but I at least need a couple of length and height type of measurements, preferably from easily recognized landmarks. So what I'll often do with this wonderful, I used to sketch them out, and it seemed awful to be making bad sketches and drawing the landmarks so that later I could make good illustrations but know where the landmarks were. Nowadays with digital illustrations, what I'll actually often do is just sit there with a the laptop and the camera 
and just import all the photos. And then as I take the measurements, literally just draw lines on the photos. So I know exactly where the measurements are taken, which is nice. It, it, it lets me not introduce extra mistakes by being stupid, which is something I'm always looking to cut out. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so if you followed me, what we have here now is hopefully a whole lot of information on, on what the dinosaur is like in general and who its relatives are. So we have an idea of the trends in the family of dinosaurs we're looking at. We have a whole ton of measurements that we have lovingly taken down in either an Excel or even just, you know, with pencil and paper on a, on a pad. And then we have lots of photographs. And those all have to go into a computer um, where I try to scale everything. You can't usually literally translate what bones look like one to one because there's usually some squishing and by usually I mean essentially always some squishing or deformation but at least if you have them there it's easy to identify as you illustrate really obvious mistakes if you like draw a vertebrae and you're like hey that is larger than the entire tail then you realize that you are probably wrong and you can you know <laughs> correct that before going any further <laughs> each bone is drawn individually which I'm going to admit right now certain bones that are repetitive which just little changes like say tails or animals with particularly long uh, rib cages or belly ribs, the like gastralia, those get really old after a while. In fact, I can tell you right now that I really detest doing skeletal reconstructions of fish because as near as I can tell, most fish consist of three and a half miles of ribs and vertebrae that are almost <laughs> identical. And they don't, and they don't really want to like, just duplicate them because that wouldn't actually be true. There are small changes as the ribs increase or decrease in height, et cetera, between them, but drawing all of them feels fantastically tedious, I have to say. <laughs> and and, and fish, fish are avoided if at all possible in my personal. <laughs> you know, I had to stop and wipe the sarcasm off my microphone when you talked about <laughs> three mile long fish. <laughs> You know, when it takes you like 10 or 15 minutes to draw an element just for the pleasure of starting on the next one, let me tell you, it uh, it, 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 it seems like it, it probably takes longer than it does, but uh, I'm like anyone else, you know, I like a little bit of difference in what I'm doing. So when it's the same thing over and over again, it does get old, but it's important to do right. And, and to give you one example, there are actually many even dinosaur skeleton drawings, many of them older now, perhaps before you know, there's sort of a new sense of rigor that might not have been there with all skeletons produced, say, you know, a couple of decades ago. But there are several out there. If you look at them, the tails are actually quite a bit too short. Really? Yeah. You know, and, and perhaps one could argue they're, they're simply being schematic. We all know what a tail looks like in certain dinosaurs. But sometimes, of course, those proportions are translated right into, like, life reconstructions or kids' book illustrations or whatever, what have you. And then what may have been intended to be schematic or to provide, you know, prevent tears of boredom becomes sort of entrenched. And so it is important to get all those right, because otherwise you aren't capturing sort of the actual physicality and proportion of the animal in question. So that's why I make myself do them. Although I do tend to find ways to trick myself. Like I can reward myself by watching, you know, checking social media or watching a cat video <laughs> something if i do five of them and then go back and do five more so anyways so once all the individual bones are done and actually to be honest usually as i'm drawing each one i tend to start to put the animal together as i go you know so each illustration of a bone is on its own layer usually i like to start from the pelvis and work forward through the vertebral column and then at that point because i don't know a priori the exact orientation of the vertebral column then i like to go in and do the, the, the appendicular skeleton, the limbs, the forelimbs and the hind limbs. And if it's a quadruped, that pretty much is going to like tell me exactly how high the shoulders are relative to the hips. And then I have a pretty good idea of exactly what the orientation is going to be of the vertebral column. Um, and from there, uh, usually it's a matter of then, you know, adding on the tail and, and the ribs and such. And I often illustrate the head in a separate file altogether at a higher resolution because I found through sometimes painful personal experience that people often want larger, more detailed diagrams of the skulls. And, if, you know, back in the old days when I, I did everything in pen and paper and ink and the resolution was only what my scanner could capture, that would often mean I'd have to go back and draw it again. So now that we live in this marvelous digital age, I simply do it bigger to start with and then scale it down. Right. Um, I should tell you that, you know, pretty much the whole time I always have like, I have two screens now and I have my digital calculator open on the other one and like scratch paper next to me. And that's because I'm doing cross-scaling, you know, where you're basically like taking uh, 
fractions and trying to solve for X. Everyone kind of does this like sometime in high school usually. It's not really difficult, but when you do it like several hundred times in a, in a weekend, which in fact is something I'm doing this weekend, you know, if you want to know how exciting my time is going to be this weekend, um, <laughs> you want to sometimes, you, every now and then you have to stop and go, okay, wait, <laughs> what was X and what was the constant here and go back and double check. So I usually have scratch paper so I can go back and check myself if uh, either the results look funny or I, uh, I just feel like I fuzzed out for a moment and need to refocus. <laughs> See, I was math was hard for me, but when they started including letters, that's when I quit. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I have enough trouble with numbers. What are letters doing in math? So, right, right. so you <laughs> So you kind of you do you would do the research to figure out what sort of family this dinosaur came from and that kind of gives you your basis your your sort of your template then, right? For what you would expect the hips to look like or what, I mean, is, does that, is, does that make sense? Is that what you do? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I try to, I try when I have the actual bones, like in your example, a 75% complete animal, I try to leave my preconceptions checked at the door and let the bones tell me as much as is possible. But for missing data, I'd much rather rely upon close relatives than guess. And the other thing is, is when you're trying to look at squished vertebrae, for example, it can really help to look at those of other relatives to understand what side is perhaps more squished than another or what, the, you know, what something looked like before it was deformed. And so, so for those reasons, yeah, the other thing I really like to have is uh, there was a habit, and it's not a horrible habit, but there's a, there was a habit I've seen a lot of times where people will say, well, it's a, it's a theropod, a kind of meat-eating dinosaur, and it's kind of like a carnosaur. So... You know, freaking they'll say, hey, Allosaurus is kind of also a large meat-eating theropod dinosaur. Why don't we just throw its arms on there? After all, no one knows what the arms look like. Right. Of course, there's some inherent truth to that. But in my experience, if you can look at the whole family, which means pulling out those, you know, phylogenetic studies full of cladograms that everybody just loves to look at. But if you pull those out, what you can often see, at least in a well-sampled dinosaur family or some other extinct group of animals is trends within it, you know, depending on where your animal is grouping out. And that gives you a much more precise, you know, way to interpret it. Let's not assume it's just like Allosaurus, but if there are several other carnosaurs and that's where it's grouping, let's actually see who the sister taxa is. And perhaps if there is a trend, what the trend within that subgroup is. Um, and then it's not just taking, you know, one size and sticking it on there because we don't know. You're picking what what the relationship suggests is the best solution, which, you know, you may still have to change someday, but at least you're, you're giving it, you know, you're going as far as the data will allow you to extrapolate realistically. Right. I, I got to tell everybody listening, if you go to Scott's website, it's skeletaldrawing.com, singular, skeletaldrawing.com. There's a page called Learn. And when you click on that page, there is Scott's handy dandy guide to dinosaur anatomy. I would encourage everybody to go to that page and look because you have laid out a detailed listing of bones and muscles and it's unlike anything I've seen most people ever have access to. So for those of you that that really like dinosaurs, I would go there and and learn those so that you can understand the terminologies. I would recommend you go there. It's a very effective tool. Teachers, in fact, uh, definitely should go there. This is a it is a great tool. I just wanted to mention that. So so let's get to the missing bones then in our skeleton, which littered your living room and caused the whole divorce thing. The and she's getting half of everything. I don't know if you know that or not. How that works, but. <laughs> It, it, that half of zero is still zero. <laughs> See, you've got a girl for life. Why would she leave? It's, there's nothing. There's no benefit. That's right. So you've got missing pieces. And my guess would be, let's say it's a missing tail vert. And so you would just pick the one ahead of it and the one that would have come behind it. And the one you put in, you just size to kind of fit between the two. I mean, is that sort of a generic term of how you do it? Yeah, that's not that's not too far off. And in fact, that's what I used to literally do pretty much exclusively. Uh, these days, what I tend to do with serial elements, that is elements that are 
you know, pretty similar but change just a little is I'll often actually drop them into an Excel spreadsheet to get a trend line. That is, a, you know, an actual sort of mathematical indication of how how much they're changing. And I can actually use that to sort of more precisely guide it rather than just go off my expectations. And that's actually a part of research I'm, I'm doing for my dissertation too on, on vertebrae in particular and how to estimate them a little bit more, uh, you know, precisely right. uh, when they're missing. So, so that's what I tend to do. Um, I don't know how common that is, nor do I know how common it should be. I, I've yet to assess like how much of a difference it'll actually make, but um, it seems like it can't hurt. So Sure. Well, and, and you're, you're not drawing for the love of it. You're drawing because these are used in a lot of uh, research papers and they're going into books. So I can understand and appreciate why you're trying to make it as accurate because like to your point about how short the tails are, well, you know, as more looking at sauropods, especially as, as more and more people are proposing that they used it as a weapon, then that long, thin end whip like tail becomes an important part. But if you left that off in your image, he looks like he has a relatively stubby blunt tail that wouldn't be as flexible. So by leaving off all those tiny little verts because of the monotony of drawing them, you could be altering, in fact, altering science by make if somebody simply based that off of the look of the skeleton, they'd say, well, that tail wouldn't be very flexible because, you know, it ends in a stump instead of a long whip like thing. So I can appreciate your need to try to make it as scientifically accurate. And who knows? I mean, I, I was at a place one time where I saw a, a, a person, I won't mention names, but they were trying to estimate the size of the skeleton of this dinosaur that they found. And they took an image and, and it may have been one of your images because it looked like it. And they projected it on the wall and found the humerus, a recognizable bone, and walked over and placed the humerus against the image and then increased and decreased the image projected on the wall until they got to where the humerus in the picture matched the humerus they were holding. And when they did, they said, this is it. This is how big this dinosaur was. And at the time I saw it, I went, man, that's pretty simplistic, but it seems Seems like an authentic way to do it. But then when you stop and think, if you did that with a human, we're not all built identical. We didn't come off of the assembly line identical. Some of us may have a longer humor. So what would be the flaw in, in that? Or what would be the benefit of doing it that way? So that's a great question. I mean, the biggest benefit, I guess, has to be simplicity, to be perfectly honest. It, you know, estimating... The size of new animals is a hard thing to do. There have been several proposed techniques and they all have their flaws, um, but most of them are a lot more complicated uh, to try. <laughs> um, so there's that. There's also the fact that if they want to make a display, that may be a prerequisite to produce a useful backdrop that you could then put your bones over. So there might be, you know, you get dual use out of that. But yeah, absolutely. Individual variation is a uh, is one of those things we know exists. And in most dinosaurs, we don't have a very good uh, grasp on exactly how, how much of a range there really was. Um, we can look at modern animals as sort of a uh, guide, and there's probably some validity to that. But the reality is, in 99.9% .9 of cases with dinosaurs, we don't have an actual population to work from. And if you don't have a valid statistical population, you really can't validly say how much variation we should expect right but that's that's simply a problem with deep time you know there are a few there was a myosaur a whole series of studies on a myosaur herd that appears to have been buried catastrophically they did some great stuff including like age cohorts that is they could see sort of like if you had 100 babies how many would still be there you know in that group of peers after a year two years three years etc so that was like a unique opportunity that you don't have too often but by and large we don't get that, you know, with most fossils. And even the few times when you have it, it might take a decade or more before you could prep out enough of the data to do that kind of a study with. Right. So that, that's definitely a legitimate problem. Um, but it's also simply, I think, it comes with the territory. You're, you're just going to have to deal with that. One thing with humans, though, with the 7 billion of us around, is I do feel like, and this sort of rapid changing of what is and isn't selective on who lives, 
which is a good thing. I'm not knocking it. But <laughs> as a result, we may, if anything, have an even broader based bell curve than some species that haven't gone through those sorts of uh, technological and social freeing themselves from uh, from the uh, predations of natural selection. Right. The one thing I questioned when I saw them do that is I said, and all I got was a dirty look, <laughs> I said, how do we know that the humerus in that image is properly scaled to that skeleton? So if the humerus of that image had been missing and somebody filled in the blank by simply estimating it, well, that alone can completely alter that that it, the rest of the skeleton, if you're, if you're basing it off of that. So, well, I, I mean, I was impressed at the simplicity and, and if, if anything, it made it look kind of realistic. Now I will say as they were finding other recognizable bones, those bones didn't match. So when they did it with a femur, they had to rescale the image. And so they did it, but by the time it was done, they were, they were probably within about eight feet each time they scaled it up or down, they stayed within a sort of an eight feet range. So I guess from a layman's terms, it it was effective. All right. So your skeletal drawings have the outline of the skin. So in other words, you you Mm -hmm. see the bones, but you put the outline of the skin. Now, when you do that, are you actually estimating what you believe the thickness of that skin was, or are you doing that more for a, artistic so that people can understand better what they're looking at? That is a great question. I'm afraid there's not a single short answer. There's about three answers to that question. I will uh, try to keep them to not be too elaborate. First, there's one very important practical reason for doing that, which is that if you draw bones without a black outline for the, as a silhouette, um, the average person, when they look at them, doesn't necessarily know whether when you measure a bone from you know you have a scale bar and then you want to go see how long the femur is whether they should stop measuring before the black line that would surround the white bone area uh, in the middle somewhere of that black line because of course those black lines have actual width to them or to the outside Uh. of the black line so if you give 10 people an image that doesn't have a silhouette you'll get at least five different measurements for how long a given element is i totally get that yeah, so that solves one practical problem. It's not perfect, of course. For example, sometimes you have bones that are overlapping other bones and you still have to have lines. Now, in my case, I'm consistent. It's always to the end of the white. If you're measuring black in mine and you're measuring a bone, you are doing it wrong. That said, <laughs> it at least eliminates the problem as far as you can easily accomplish it. That, so that's the practical answer. Certainly, I think there is an aesthetic one that lets you pack in more information. And then you get to start talking about, of course, what the actual uh, soft tissues are. Um, now, I do estimate that. I, uh, I have done quite a lot of dissections in my days. And so, and I, of course, I, in addition to my own work, try to keep up currently with all the ongoing publications of uh, muscle reconstructions and such. So those are all actually intended as estimates of the overlying muscles and tendons. One important misconception that's out there a lot, though, and uh, I actually plan to hopefully write up a blog post on this because this is, I think, a really important thing that's missed, is those are flayed. There is not skin on those reconstructions. What they is... are muscle flayed. Yes. Uh, when you remove the like fur feathers and outer dermal or skin layer. So if you've ever had an anatomy course, even in high school, where maybe you had to dissect the cat, if you get them with the fur already off, or if you didn't and you had to sit there and do that phase where you had to tease back the skin, when you were done with that step, you would have a flayed cat. Got it. Maybe not a pretty image, but it's the one I could think of that the most people would have first experienced. Uh, If you're a hunter, of course, and you're butchering your meat, if you were to just remove the skin and take the rest of the carcass back uh, for someone else to deal with, or if you're having it mounted and the person is mounting it took the skin off one piece and had the rest of the carcass, those would all be flayed animals also. Right. So when you look at a skeletal reconstruction, what you're seeing is the estimated depth of connective tissue and muscles, but not of, say, fat, or if they had particularly thick skin, which some taxa probably did, or if they had fur or feathers adding bulk to it. Got and it. that's partially just due to tradition. That's how quite a few other illustrators have done it before I started. And it's also from a mass estimate point of view, which I do sometimes use these as part of what's uh, a type of uh, graphical integration 
for mass estimates, you don't really want to add on other fluff, right? You can make a cat look a lot bigger when it's all furry. And if you dip it in water, it will be angry, but it will also look a lot smaller as probably people with pets are familiar right. uh, with at least a long haired cat. So, so it sort of helps avoid that. Um, and also while we can estimate muscle depth, not with the same precision as you can muscle or bone outlines, you can still do it with a lot more precision in most cases than you can with what fur or feathers or scales look like because we don't frequently get those preserved. And the reason I say this is because you do see lots of illustrations where people, well-intentioned artists, take a skeletal drawing and they, let's be generous and say, draw it freehand, but very, very closely to the outline. And they don't account for that. And we're not talking about a huge difference. Skin is not actually necessarily all that thick in many areas of the skeleton, which is why you can easily feel, say, the end of your ulna at your elbow where the electronon process sticks out, etc., or your ribs and in many, though not all of us. So like, I don't feel like that's inherently wrong, but it may, it may lead to the trend of dinosaurs sometimes being restored as a little overly skinny if they don't know that and take some artistic license to account for that difference. Well, you know, it's it's funny you mention that because I just recently had a young person write to me and say, so many of these dinosaur images and books almost look like the dinosaurs are emaciated. Like you can see, you can see the vertebra down the backbone and you can see the, the, the vertebra down the tail. And there's not many living animals today that it's anywhere near like that. I mean, you can't, you can't pick out the backbones in most animals. And so I wonder if that's not an end result of that very thing, thinking that a, a reference skeleton like your drawing would then assume that is the exterior of the dinosaur instead of recognizing that's not the exterior. You're drawing where you think musculature would end. And then there would be a layer of, like you said, it could be fat or whatever on top of that. Yes, I think that is probably partially my fault as well as, uh, you know, um, Greg Paul did something similar and some other uh, artists who have done things before. It. Um, I accept that. In fact, you'd be surprised how much guilt this sort of vocation comes with. I, you know, especially <laughs> when I have to change skeletons because of new information. And sure. I see artists who are like, oh my gosh, I have to redo my art. I'm like, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, it was the yeah. best data we had at the time. Right. So, yeah, I think there is some truth to that. That said, I'm sure you've seen lately that there's been sort of a counter movement to this where people do want to add more flesh and acknowledge some of the harder to estimate parts of, of this. The, uh, the all yesterday's book and sort of movement of the same name is sort of the group of people who are most commonly associated with this. And that, by the way, for people listening, is a book that I'm only peripherally associated with. I supplied the skeletal reconstructions, so I feel I can brag about it. It's really a great book for anyone interested in paleo art, as it, it not only goes over perhaps where we people have been overly zealous in trying to herd everyone together when we didn't actually know that those are similarities. But it also does some really fun things like reconstructing living animals using some of the assumptions people have used in the past about them to see just how crazy different some of them would look. What is the title of the book? All Yesterdays. And is it something they can purchase through your website? Not through my website. If you go to irregularbooks.co, you would also find it. That's cool. I, I Nothing, bet you. I bet you it's fascinating. Yeah, it, it is, and it's not a. It's not a super like long, hard read book. It's meant to be an accessible book for you know general readers, which is neat. There's not a lot of books that have done this. Now, having said that, and built up how awesome it is, and it is. Uh, people who are interested in this, I highly recommend they check it out. The wonderful thing about the internet and everybody being connected is that like we tend to not so much hone down on accuracies as much as we have like over corrections right. <laughs> and and i have seen and I, I hopefully depending on my free time i'll have a blog post forthcoming as i have seen people you know whose worry is that all dinosaurs should actually be shown with with plenty of fat and lots of skin or other things on them and if you look at animals you don't see that either necessarily you see in fact quite a variety if you look at elephants it's actually pretty easy to find elephants where you can pick out individual tops of the, of the uh, neural spines, the backbones, or see, you know, see in cows really obvious uh, hip bones sticking out, for example. Right. And in lions, which have shorter fur, of course, than many other big cats, you can often see incredible amounts of muscular detail, especially if they're walking around or running, you know, as opposed to just like lazing out uh, in the sun. 
And so, you know, there is room for both. What we really need for people to do, and this was actually the message of all, all yesterday's, I'm not criticizing the book so much as, again, the occasional overcorrection in the online social media areas right. <laughs> um, of its sense, is that, uh, uh, you know, the response can be, oh, I can see any muscle definition, that's just too skinny. And that's not necessarily an accurate summary of what we see in the world either. So, right. All right. The last question now about just the generalities of this, and this has bothered me since I would say probably my early twenties is the first time it ever dawned on me. And this happened when I was standing there looking at a, at a big sauropod skeleton. How do you estimate the thickness of cartilage that would have existed between the vertebra? Because just looking at the sheer number of vertebra and the length of this animal, I've always wondered when they're estimating the size of the dinosaur, is that taken into account? And when you're drawing it, is it taken into account? And if it is, does it, those variances really make that much of a difference or would it add or decrease length considerably if you over or underestimate what was going on between the verts? All right. Well, that, that is yet another wonderful question. <laughs> um, and it, again, unfortunately, doesn't have a simple answer. So the short version is yes. They certainly almost all would have had cartilage, and in some cases, quite a lot of cartilage. It turns out that the shape of the body of the vertebrae, what's called the centrum, if you're all you know, fancy and anatomical, helps give you some clues about perhaps how much cartilage you would expect. In some, though not all cases, um, where you have sort of a cup and ball articulation between the vertebrae, you are more likely to find there to be less cartilage. That is where the estimate of the cartilage is going to be less of a problem. Um, in other vertebrae where you have two flat sides or two sides that are actually sort of ball on ball, et cetera, then you might have a much broader margin of error about how much cartilage can go in there. Obviously, this is in comparison to extant animals, and there do seem to be some loose rules there. There are also some ways to actually try to use math to apply this, um, which I won't go into in detail, but if you had a perfectly pre preserved set of vertebrae, imagine, that would include the uh, extra or accessory articulations, which go by the tongue-twisting name zygopophyses. And in theory, if you had really, really wonderfully preserved three-dimensional uncrushed vertebrae, you would know that those also have to be in articulation, and it would sort of constrain, once you have those correctly placed, how far apart or close together the, uh, the lower part of the body of the vertebrae could get without, you know, starting to, to like change the orientation of the top since they're pretty tall structures. So you can, you can use that to try and uh, estimate how much uh, cartilage should be, should have been in there in life. But there are a whole bunch of underlying measurements necessary and preservational re requirements to really do that well right. with confidence. Right. Um, so most people as a general estimate go with somewhere between like five and 10% cartilage between the average sort of flat body and on other flat body end vertebrae. And that seems to me like a reasonable place to go. There are some specimens I've seen where it looks like the cartilage may have been thicker. And there are some where perhaps it was a little thinner, but given the, the constraints of the data we have and often the squishing, like, I don't know if we can do much better than that in most cases. Um, the nice thing is, like, when we're talking about, like, who's the longest dinosaur, the sort of, like, locker room juvenile competition that many of us paleontologists get into when we find, like, a new sauropod or what have you, is that being off, A, everyone's probably off by roughly the same percent. There's probably not reason to think that closely related dinosaurs had radically different amounts of cartilage. And B, given how many times we have to reconstruct missing chunks, say, in the tail, 5% uh, due to cartilage is probably not the biggest source of of error we have. So I think it's an important issue to be aware of. And certainly you don't want to restore all the vertebrae as like being smack locked together because that's that would be very uncomfortable. I'd be like what Peyton Manning ended up having to have <laughs> happen to his neck. Uh, right. And uh, so if you did that to your dinosaurs, they would never play in the Super Bowl. But um, <laughs> And that's why they haven't. Man, we learn right, something exactly, every yeah. day. <laughs> you are such a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> Or something. All right. <laughs> That's why I get the big bucks. Or That's it. Ex someday. Exactly right. All right. So let's let's now move into Dinochirus. What a what an odd 
ball this thing has turned out to be. First, can you yeah. kind of describe to, because uh, that now earlier in the episode, I would have covered the basics of the animal, but no detail okay. about what it looks like. I was kind of leaving that up to you to kind of describe what on earth this thing actually is. I think the short version is, is if you combine Daffy Duck with a camel. Um, the longer version. That, well, that ends this it episode, it? everybody. That's about, <laughs> as, that's about as clear a decision. I mean, honestly. It is. I'm being genuine. That is the greatest single description I've ever heard in my life. For those of you who aren't or are having trouble making that connection, uh, it is a two-legged dinosaur. It's a theropod dinosaur. It is related to ornithomimids, which have toothless beaks on the ends of their heads. But most ornithomimids look like streamlined sports car sorts of dinosaurs that ran fast and are gra- graceful, graceful and have like relatively small toothless beaked heads on relatively thin-looking necks and long striding legs. And this looks like sort of the Mac truck on steroids version of those dinosaurs. So it is still two-legged, but it's got a huge rear end. There's a lot of junk in that trunk. And then the back kind of humps upwards, probably as a platform to support the, the long but also relatively thick neck in a wide variety of up and down poses because there's a lot of weight on the end of that because it has a really big, still toothless beaked head with a really giant lower jaw. So I guess maybe I could have said it's like the Jay Leno Daffy Duck camel. But um, that's probably a joke that's lost on most of the younger generation. So, um, Look, Daffy Duck was lost on the younger generation. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame the way you youngsters neglect the classics these days. Yeah. Um, this is science, for God's sakes. Pay attention, that's people. Right. You know what's funny is I'm, I'm sure you talked earlier about how they'd found the four limbs so many years ago. Right. Yes. And for you know how what a huge mystery it was to have these gigantic four limbs you know in a museum in in China all this time and be like what weird animal could they belong to? And the funny thing is the four limbs are like the most normal part of this weird critter. Well, talking about those like, four limbs, did you ever attempt to try to draw? what you think it looked like based solely off of those arms. I did not. I resisted the temptation and I can't tell you how happy I am that I resisted because man, would I have not been right. I can tell you whatever I would have cooked up. It would not have looked like this. I don't think anybody could have. I, I no, I don't I, think so. I realize as they studied them more and you started hearing more about ornithomima that, that, you know, ornithomima sources that you went, okay, I get it. It's just a giant struthiomimus with gigantic arms. But, you know, some of the earliest drawings I saw were included things like lo- looking like Megalosaurus or looking like Allosaurus or Therizinosaurus even. Yeah, or, that's true. And then you, you can see the appeal because Therizinosaurus also have large hands with large claws on them. But yeah, no, this is, this gives Therizinosaurus a run for the weirdness money. You're not kidding. So... As somebody who studies anatomy, when you saw the first reconstruction, uh, obviously you were like everyone else. Your jaw just dropped and went, I've never seen a Daffy Duck, Camel, Jay Leno dinosaur before. But when you looked at their reconstruction, did you see anything about the way it was reconstructed that made you think, I don't think that could be accurate or I don't think that would be the right angle do you know what i mean were you able to critique what you saw based solely on your knowledge of anatomy um no uh i i was a little suspicious when i saw it but that's i'm inherently suspicious of all skeletal drawings i didn't do and some of the ones i did do so that in and of itself is not a weird response uh when it came out it was restored a bit more therizinosaur like with the whole back and hips sort of tilted up and it necessitated curving the tail upward at the base qu- uh, quite strongly the way it is in Therizinosaurs. And I did notice at a glance that I wasn't quite sure that the tail really did that, that there was really quite as extreme of an angle as like the initial drawing showed because there, there seemed to be wedge-shaped gaps in between the vertebrae, suggesting that they'd sort of moved it further than like the default neutral pose, which, you know, the neutral pose is not always the pose you would see animals in every day, but nonetheless, 
it, it did make me you know, have me thinking. To be honest, in this case, the reason I tackled this was for uh, a textbook I worked on uh, a year ago, uh, the, which would be the the most recent sixth edition of the Lucas, uh, the dinosaurs, dinosaurs the textbook, uh, I guess is the name. And that was a really fun experience. And they needed the Dinochirus. and so I did it. I was like, aha, that'll be great. There's a two really fantastic skeletons. And now working through that is when I realized that if you look at the pelvis. The pelvis isn't really built like therizinosaurs, actually. Therizinosaurs have retroverted, that is backward pointing, lower pelvic elements, and some other modifications to it, which help tilt the whole torso up. And Dinochirus instead seems to have the vertebrae themselves kink up in front of it. That is, the, the sacrum is sort of wedge-shaped on the front, so that the back exits at a high angle, but then it comes back down. So if you drew a line from the you know first back bone to the last backbone, it would actually be horizontal, but in much the same way a tent is horizontal if you look at the base of it. You know, it still gets very tall in the middle. Right. Um, and also, if you look at the hips, the big hip bone, the ilium that all the leg muscles came off of, you can also see that it actually angles up really strongly as it goes forward, presumably to you know, provide the large muscles, those would be iliocostalis muscles for people at home and a few of the other axial muscles um, to help hold the back up. And probably rather than any kind of a sail back, it was kind of a humped dinosaur there. So what is the function of that? You, you mentioned it first in your description. He does have this gigantic hump, not a sail, not a sail like, like the sail of a Spinosaurus or Demeterdon or one of those guys. It's actually a hump, right? Yeah, that's what it looks like uh, to me. So at the end of it, you have this long U-shaped neck which is how, you know, if you look at hadrosaurs, they've modified their vertebral columns so that you have down curved front of the back, you know, bone and then up curved sort of U-shaped necks. And that seems to support deeper neck nuchal ligaments and muscles. It was also pointed out by uh, uh, Andrea Kao that uh, Spinosaurus, at least as, as he's restored, it also has a fairly U-shaped neck coming off there. Um, and in the case of Spinosaurus, it wouldn't have a strongly arched back, of course, but it would have taller neural spines, which might have partially supported uh, muscles, even if not the whole length of them did. And that's an interesting parallel. And it's interesting because what they found inside of Dinochirus was fish scales. And of course, Spinosaurus rather famously is thought to have been, you know, like all, all other Spinosaurus, uh, a fish eater, at least in part. Right. And so maybe the point of this tall hump and the relatively thick neck and the arched back is to give it a strong base. Of, of better leveraged muscles and ligaments to support that big head going down relative, you know, frequently throughout the day, trying to like uh, catch a fish. You know, if you want to imagine, you can't just scale up a stork to be five tons because, you know, without changing the proportions, because like the neck would go down and never come back up with that spindly little neck. Right. And so this might be essentially what you have to do in order to make uh, one of these guys into, you know, something that could be more, more stork-like in their behavior with the neck coming down frequently to ground level or to water level in order to uh, do it. What's really interesting is those big arms with the big grasping claws. I don't, you know, it's tempting to, I've had some people suggest how they're getting down on them and I, they don't look like they have any adaptations for locomotion. But of course, spinosaurs in general, baryonyx, et cetera, also have well-clawed, robust forearms, which begs the question of what exactly is going on, I guess. With these animals, if they're fishing, why they, you know, have these large, well-muscled, fairly robust for meat-eating dinosaur forelimbs? Are they like wrestling really giant fish, like lungfish or something? Right. Um, I, I find that easier to imagine with something like Baryonyx or Suchomimus or Spinosaurus because they have croc-like teeth and could relatively easily tear off parts of a giant, you know, twelve-foot-long lungfish. I'm not really sure how Dinochirus would do that. So I'm not quite sure what's going on with that combination, but I do think it's fascinating that there is a little bit of a parallel between Dinochirus and those dinosaurs, even if Dinochirus looks possibly even quite a bit weirder. Boy, it is a, it is a weird looking dinosaur. I, uh, uh, in fact, this is the first I'll announce it. Um, I've got a traveling museum and we are waiting on the arms the replica arms of a Dinochirus to add to the museum. So I, I'm like a kid waiting for Christmas day. I can't wait for that crate to show up just to see them. I've never seen how big they are up close, but I am excited to, to get them. And now for people to see what look, 
what the animal looked like that went with them. I think some people are going to think this can't be it. This, this, because the arms just make you immediately think of some giant tyrannosaur looking vile monster. And then you get this thing, which is not vile, but just as weird as anything, anything I've ever seen. All right. Here is my last question for you. Is there a new species or something in particular that you are intrigued with that you would like to draw that you are currently not drawing, or even if you are currently drawing it, because so many new discoveries, is there anything out there that, that you really want to work on? <laughs> I want to collect them all. Uh, <laughs> my own little scientific Pokemon, I guess. Um, <laughs> the biggest problem really right now is time. Uh, there aren't you know, a whole lot of positions where you can just sit around and do anatomical diagrams all the time. Obviously, that would be swell. What I'm currently working on, like literally this moment in, on the screen in front of me, uh, is I'm currently scaling a new version of Stegosaurus, uh, or based on the, the really great uh, British Museum of Natural History specimen that was described by uh, by Maidemont in, in fantastic detail. I'm um, going to clarify some great things about the, the vertebral column, like the length of the neck and the, how compact the body was. That was not clear from uh, previous specimens, and so I'm having to go back to the the virtual drawing board and pretty much start from scratch on that. So, Oh, wow. Wow. That's, that's really neat. I mean, everybody recognizes Stegosaurus as being such an iconic dinosaur, but you know, it sounds like he may be, he may be getting an upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. I will let you know when it comes to pass. Yeah, I would love to know. Well, his images can be seen in numerous academic publications, books, and in museums throughout North America. And his website is loaded with images and articles, really good articles, and detailed information about dinosaur anatomy. His website is SkeletalDrawing.com, and he is paleontologist and anatomist, Mr. Scott Hartman. Scott, thank you so much for taking time to do this. Thank you, George. It was a pleasure to be here. We should do it again sometime. Absolutely, man. Bring Dinosaur George's traveling exhibit to your school, museum, or city. This is the largest exhibit of its kind in North America and will turn any facility into a natural history museum. You'll see things like prehistoric mammals, giant fish, ancient reptiles, and of course, dinosaurs. It's affordable, amazing, and will be an event you'll never forget. See complete details at dinosaurgeorge.com or call us toll free, 888-487-7478. Bring Dinosaur George's traveling museum to your community today. It's time to ask Dinosaur George. In this segment, George answers your questions about paleontology. If you would like to leave a voice message, call us at 210-888-9077. This is not a toll-free call, so children, please ask your parents' permission. If you would like to submit your question in writing, go to dinosaurgeorge.com and click the Ask Dinosaur George page. Questions are chosen at random and we clear all messages monthly. So if you have a question about paleontology, ask Dinosaur George. All right, for the Ask Dinosaur George segment, we'll answer a couple of questions. This first one comes from Josh in Manila, Philippines. Hey, Mr. Blasting, until recently I was a firm believer that dromaeosaurs like Deinonychus and Velociraptors were pack hunters. But I read an article somewhere that suggested that they may have behaved more like Komodo dragons. Instead, uh, instead of forming uh, organized mobs, they were sort of disorganized mobs that took down prey and cannibalized smaller individuals, which I find rather interesting. Do you think it's true? Hope your traveling museum comes to the Philippines soon. Well, Josh, I wish it would come to the Philippines as well. And uh, I would love to to come visit your country. I appreciate you calling me Mr. Blasting. But I remember, Josh, uh, I I have no problems with you guys calling me George or DG or whatever you prefer. So did these raptors, dromaeosaurs is the proper term. Thank you, Josh, for using that. Did these raptors or dromaeosaurs hunt in organized groups or were they more like these disorganized Komodo dragon mobs? Here's what I believe. There's been discoveries of groups of Deinonychus that all were killed together. And there are groups of um, Utah Raptor, I believe, that are found in groupings. And when you're found together at the same place, then you died together at the same place. And Komodo dragons only assemble in the same place 
when food is involved. So it would be very likely that if you were to go to the island of Komodo 20, 30 million years from now, you would find skeletons, but I think you would find them all over the place rather than being together. When you live your life together in a group, you're more likely to die together, like during flooding. Now, of course, it's possible that an animal's death drew in some of those raptors who weren't involved in killing it, and then something happened that caused them all to die. But that's that's unlikely. The other thing to look at them is when you are designed the way they are, with all of these abilities and all of these um, all these different uh, features like the slashing claws and all those things individually, they're not really designed to take on the bigger prey that they lived with, but uniformly as a group, now they're better suited for attacking bigger prey. So when your prey is big and you need help, then it makes sense that you have organized groups. That's just my opinion, but that is an interesting concept, though. I do find that kind of interesting. All right, Austin from St. Louis, Missouri. Hey, what's up, DG? Hey, Austin, what's up with you, man? It's your old friend, Austin. Austin, it's so good to hear from you. I've got two questions, he says. Have you heard of the new titanosaur that was discovered recently? And second, we have a good estimate on Spinosaurus's length of 50 feet, but what do you think it weighed? Okay, the new discovery of Titanosaur. I got to tell you something, Austin. There's so many discoveries happening so fast and coming so quickly. I don't know which particular Titanosaur you may be referring to because there's so many of them. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited every time a new dinosaur is discovered. And recently, seems like there's a lot of sauropods being found. Sauropods are the long neck dinosaurs uh, for some of you little guys. Uh, as for your second question about the length of Spinosaurus, boy, I got to tell you, this is a toughie because I have seen Spinosaurus go through the most dramatic morphing I've ever seen in my life. And that, of course, is, is always uh, because of new discoveries. You know, its entire body design seems to have changed and it's it doesn't look anything like it used to look like. Now, whether we're accurate or not, I don't know, but I suspect New discoveries give new evidence and new evidence gives new ideas. So, um, so as for its size, I don't even know if 50 feet is accurate. That, that is a big, big animal. Um, and then its weight is almost impossible to estimate until we can come to an agreement on what its body is shaped like, like how big were the rib cage? Therefore, how large are the internal organs? Therefore, how did that impact the weight of the animal? You see what I mean? So I don't know. I've seen estimates that range between three and eight tons, some going as high as nine tons. And you go, well, that is such a dramatic difference. But again, it has to do with a lot of factors that we don't have the answers to as of yet. Like how thick is the skin? How much did the skin weigh? How muscular were they? Um, how much did the muscles weigh? So those are why I don't know if there is a re, a legitimate estimate in weight yet that I think is is realistic. But thank you for writing to me, buddy. All right, Alex from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Were there any big meat eaters that lived with Utah Raptor? And if so, would it be Acrocanthosaurus or a different carnivore? You know, I think Acrocanthosaurus lived at the same time, Alex. I don't know if acros have been found in that Utah, Wyoming area or not. I know acros are found all the way up the, from Texas all the way up to Maryland. So I know they're living along, uh, along that area, but I don't know if Utah Raptor came in contact. Now by the mid, by the early to mid Cretaceous, there are giant carnivores everywhere. I mean, look, they, they, they're there by mid Jurassic or late Jurassic, so there's giant carnivores inhabiting every ecosystem on the planet. So certainly I would suspect that there would be some living alongside of Utah Raptor. Unfortunately, I wish I had time to do a little bit of research before I read these questions, but I just, I don't, unfortunately. So I haven't had time, but there's got to be, I suspect there's got to be. All right. Last question. Mateo from San Antonio, Texas. Hey, George, hope you're doing well. I've been meaning to hear your thoughts on the new discovery of that cat-sized pterosaur fossil found in Canada. Hope you're uh, hope to hear from you, Matteo. Matteo, hey, um, I don't know if you saw it or not, but in that uh, P. 
PBS television show where they did a story about my museum. There's some great footage of you in there when you were there working with us. So uh, you're a movie star now, Mateo, or TV star, Mateo. So congratulations. And thanks again, by the way, for helping out uh, during that event. So, yeah, the little cat-sized pterosaur. You know, I've been... I've been holding off talking about pterosaurs because I've invited a pterosaur specialist to come on with us. And I don't want to take anything away because this pterosaur might be one of the subjects we're going to be talking about. So as much as it pains me not to go into any detail about it, Mateo, let me tell you this. If we're able to work around her schedule and we're able to find time to do an interview, uh, then you'll see it come up as a feature uh, creature in one of the upcoming podcasts. All right, if you'd like to um, if you'd like to submit a question, you can go to my website, which is dinosaurgeorge.com, and you can click on the Ask Dinosaur George page, and then you could submit your question in writing. Or if you'd like to go through Skype, my handle is uh, dinosaur.george. You can go on there and. Uh, you can uh, you can read about or, or you can uh, leave your message that way, or you can call us directly at 210-888-9077. All right, everybody, that wraps up episode 106. I hope you enjoyed the interview with paleontologist Scott Hartman. The Ask Dinosaur George segment was a lot of fun to do. I get questions from you all the time, so I'll absolutely continue to include those anytime I can. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You'll see links on my podcast page. The podcast page is dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com, and uh, I hope you'll go check it out and uh, uh, follow us on those uh, social media. Uh, Also, visit my online catalog, store.dinosaurgeorge.com. It's not just dinosaurs. I have an entire line of modern animals, and I mean hundreds of animals, so it's really cool. And then check out my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, everybody, I'm Dinosaur George. Have a great day. Treat your family and friends and neighbors and strangers with all the respect you can because you make the world a much better place. Thank you for listening to the Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past. 